Okay, hello everyone, welcome back. Um, so, what I'm doing in this particular video is um, recording, running through, practicing the week 7 lecture for PSY 4050 um, and making a recording that I can then make available on UniHub as a bit of supplementary material um, so people can make use of it. Uh, should they wish to. Alright, so today, this is week seven, our fourth lecture. What we're talking about today is correlation and chi-square. So today, last week we focused on um, comparing groups, comparing means, differences between group means, t-test and anode. But this week we're looking at relationships and associations between variables. Um, and in particular, we're talking, we're looking at correlation and chi-square. So I'm just going to quickly go through these first few slides and pretty much read what's on them. So the aims uh, of the content that we're going to cover this week is, we're gonna, I'm going to, in this lecture and in lab classes, we're going to introduce the concept of correlation, demonstrate how covariance is cal calculated and how the correlation coefficient is derived from it. So there are two steps to working out correlation coefficients, such as Pearson's R. Um, I'm going to show you how we model, share, model shared variance and the uh, how, how it's useful to know about that and um, the context in which we can use it when controlling for third, fourth or other variables. Um, and the fourth thing on there, we're going to examine the relationship between categorical variables using chi-square analysis. So hopefully a lot of this is revision uh, stuff that many of you will have encountered before. And this should just refresh your memories to some extent or, or deepen your understanding. That would be better, wouldn't it? Um, okay, so learning outcomes. So after this week's lecture and lab class, you should be able to Draw, draw and interpret scatter plots using SPSS. Calculate and interpret correlation coefficients. Calculate the proportion of variance explained by a correlation and interpret the chi-square statistic and when it is used. Okay, I'll pretty straightforward. I start with correlation. So frequently we want to assess the relationship and effect size between variables where there's no specific distinction between an independent variable and a dependent variable. So we're not, we're not necessarily manipulating an independent variable to see what happens to the dependent variable. We're just looking at the relationship between a couple of, of variables. So we want to look at how they're related and how scores on one might change as scores on the other change. We also can't uh, necessarily or infer causality and say one variable causes the other in these kind of these types of designs, these correlational designs. Uh, although there is some sort of association and relationship between the variables, we're not saying this causes that. Sometimes we might, based on theory, think that that's the case, but we can't really we can't really show that with this type of analysis. Uh, so if the variables that we're looking at are scale variables, so they're measured on a continuous scale, they could be they could have discrete measurements, but we've got some sort of scale of measurement for them. Uh, then we'd use some we'd use a correlation analysis. Uh, we're, so we're simply ex assessing the extent to which variables are correlated co when we're looking at the relationship between two continuous or scale variables like this. Uh, so an example might be years of education and income. We might want to look at the the relationship between these two variables. Um, and we'd probably find that they're, they are associated, so people who have more education tend to earn more money over the long run, although neither is manipulated and inference about ca causality isn't really possible because there could be other variables that influence what people's income is beyond um, just how, much, how, many, how many degrees they've got, how much education they've got. Okay, so it's these type of situations that we're interested in. Uh, most commonly, we look at correlation between two variables, uh, you know, what is referred to as a bivariate correlation, and we can plot these variables on a scatter plot. And uh, 
the, this gives us a good a good way to visualize a good visual impression of their relationship so it's a good place to start uh, when we're looking at correlation is to create a scatter plot look at the relationship between the two variables okay so bivariate correlation if we plot the two variables x and y as you can see them on this kind of little figure here we've got uh, the horizontal axis is the x-axis the vertical axis is the y-axis as per convention um, we can see the relationship between these two these two variables um, and we can work out a standardized measure of the relationship between them by calculating what is now is known as the co correlation coefficient on this slide the correlation coefficient is shown as r this is usually used to refer to pearson's r so it's the r you can see there above that figure which is in lowercase okay there are a number of different correlation coefficients uh, Pearson's R is probably the most commonly used one with normally distributed or parametric data. The full name for it has actually got quite a, a grandiose full technical name and it's that is Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient but Pearson's R is what people refer to it as. So R provides an index of the relationship between var two variables on a scale from negative one to one right on this particular plot we're seeing a perfect positive correlation as scores on the x x variable increase by some amount scores on the y variable are also increasing by a kind of regular amount as well so all the points sit on this nice straight diagonal line and our cor correlation coefficient r is equal to one so r equals one is written above there that would be a perfect positive correlation um, you're, when you so when you're seeing a, a a correlation like this, where scores are increasing on both variables, then you know you have a positive relationship. As scores on X go up, scores on Y go up. You're never really likely to see a perfect correlation unless you correlate to a, a variable with itself. There's always going to be some noise. Uh, certainly in psychology data, which is generally quite messy when you're measuring behaviour. Okay, so let's look at some more. I've got a couple more scatter plots on, on this slide. So the figure on the left there, you've this time we've got uh, our x and y axes and a diagonal line pointing down with the data points on it. And above it, it's got r equals negative one. So um, the pattern of the, the data influences the extent of relationship and the associated correlation coefficient. And we we can see here some differences in those relationships. So where R is negative one, as scores on the x variable increase, scores on the y variable decrease. So in this case, the points sit along this perfectly straight line. Again, so the, this represent, represents a perfect negative correlation. So we saw on the previous slide, a perfect positive correlation. R is one. R equal to one. All the points set, sat on a diagonal line pointing up and to the right. This time, this line's pointing down and to the left, and we've got an R of negative one. Okay. Uh, on the second figure there, the one on the right, um, we've got an R equal to zero. So the dots are scattered all over the plot, uh, and when there's no relationship between the vari between our two variables, the data points will be scattered evenly across the plot, just like this. Uh, in this case, the correlation coefficient will be close to zero. It's never going to be exactly zero, I would have thought. Uh, and these three examples, r equals zero, r equals negative one, and r equals positive one, these are kind of uh, extreme cases. These are kind of your edge cases. Um, in reality, what you're likely to find is a situation somewhere between those extremes. So in on this, this particular figure here, we've got an R of roughly equal to about 0.5. So because the data is generally quite messy and contains variability and noise, we usually end up with this type of relationship or it could be, it could be in a negative direction, it could be a positive direction. Um, it could be less obvious what the pattern is um, but this r equal this is r equals 0.5 um, so it's a positive 
correlation and you can see there the points are kind of going up and to the, uh, to the right in a positive direction as x increases y increases but there's there is scatter if we were to fit a line on that plot there is scatter around that line yeah um so you can uh, another important point to think about is that you can use correlation coefficients as a measure of effect of effect size so so r equals 0.5 a pattern of data that looks a bit like this <coughs> would represent a large effect size and it's very rare you'd get such a large correlation in psychology. Generally, you get correlations on the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, things like that. Uh, rare to get such a large correlation. But they do, they do happen uh, in some cases. Okay, so. Calculating the correlation coefficient. So that's... We they, we have an impression of the direction from these from these slides. We've got an impression of what the relationship might be. That we've got a positive relationship, or we've got a negative relationship, or what appears to be no relationship. But um, how what we what we are interested in is how we calculate the cor correlation coefficient r. So how we quantify that. And there are two steps. Uh, first, we calculate the covariance of our two variables, and then where the second step, we divide by the product of the standard deviation for both variables to standardize on a scale between negative one and one. OK. And the reason we do this the reason we so the reason the correlation coefficient is quite useful is it's a standardized measure. As, as an index of the relationship between two variables. Um, and the reason we do these two steps when calculating the coefficients is we, we may have two variables that have been measured on very different scales. So one could have been measured on a scale you know, like one to zero to 100 and another on a scale of 100,000 to, to a million or something like that. So the magnitude of the scales could be very different. Uh, so we have to standardize the measure using this this second step where um, after working out the covariance we divide through by the product of the standard deviation so i'll talk us through that um so the formula kit you can see here on the right of the slide is the formula for the covariance so that's step one calculating the covariance and this should look familiar it is the formula for variance that, and it's changed slightly as there are two variables now. If you remember when we, the formula for variance was, was uh, we summed over each score minus the mean and squared it. So we took each score, we subtracted the mean from it uh, and we, we summed them all together. We squared them and then summed them all together. And then we divided by the degrees of freedom to work out the variance. And in this case, rather than squaring, so rather than x minus x, x mean times x minus x mean, what we've got here is x minus x mean times y minus y mean. So we've got, uh, we've got uh, the first variable multiplied by the second variable, or the difference between the, the difference between each data point and the mean. And then those are summed and we divide by the degrees of freedom, okay? Right, so that's, that uh, is pretty straightforward. That's the first step. Um, we have worked out the covariance, but these things could be measured on quite different scales. So the, the problem with that covariance statistic is that its size depends on the range of values taken by the two variables. OK, and if we want a statistic to measure the degree of relationship between those two variables, we don't want it to be influenced by the scales on which the variables are measured. OK, so that brings us to step two, standardize. So if we divide the covariance by the product of the standard deviations for the two variables, we get Pearson's R, our correlation coefficient. Yeah, and you can see the you can see the formula for this. Um, and you get uh, on the slide so what you've got is r with sub x y so the correlation coefficient between x and y is equal to the covariance of x and y which was what we worked out on this previous slide here 
that covariance of x and y divided by the s sub x times s sub y so s sub x being the standard deviation of y, x s sub y being the standard deviation of y and the, the fact that they're written together like that tells us they're, be, they're, they're being multiplied so where they're taking the product of the standard deviation of each variable and that's the thing that goes in the denominator denominator with we're working out our covariance with and in and then we're dividing it by this product of the standard deviation uh, you will see lots of different equations in textbooks for r working for pearson's r some will look quite complicated but all are equivalent to the one i've put on this slide here okay so uh, don't if you see different versions of it don't get confused because you what you might find is you they, they, they've taken the right hand side of this particular formula which has got the, the sigma notation and divided by n minus one and rather than writing covariance x y to save space like I've done here they've actually put that into the equation right so don't get too confused if you see multiple different uh, or what appear to be multiple different formulas uh, for this particular coefficient they all are equivalent and they will simplify to this all right so that's all well and good we know that we now know we can visualize a correlation and we can uh, look at the direction and we can work out the strength of the correlation with our correlation coefficient. Um, but an, an additional thing, anyone who's done, anyone who's run a correlation analysis, analysis before will know that you you kind of get the, you get your R coefficient, you also get a p-value, a, a significance value associated with it. And I, for, a, for a long time, I was kind of, it confused me as to what, you know, what is that actually measuring? When you have a significant or non-significant correlation, what is that actually telling you? And, and why do you need it if we're looking at the, at the strength of association, how much one varies when the other varies? So, you know, what, what does it actually mean for a correlation to be significant? So the probability associated with a correlation coefficient is testing the hypothesis that the correlation is different from zero okay that there is no relationship um, and you can see that i've kind of put these these images that i used a few slides back on this particular slide so we've got an r of negative one perfect negative correlation and we've got an r of zero and what we're doing is we're doing a test um, to see whether whether the the straight straight downward facing and pointing diagonal line for r equals one is in this case is significantly different to that very evenly scattered distribution if we were to fit a line to the r equals zero there what we'd probably find is that it was completely horizontal and it sat kind of about the middle of the distribution of points okay so we're looking to see if if they if our line is significantly different from zero essentially and there are a couple of different ways in which the probabil probability can be calculated to test this hypothesis okay so is it significantly different from zero the first the first method to work out a significance level uses z scores and an adjusted version of R so that R is kind of normally distributed. And the Z scores on the normally distributed version of the of, of the correlation coefficient of R um, that we've calculated can then be used to give us a p-value. So as you guys know, when we when we convert to a Z score, we can work out how far something is from the mean and if it lies within a certain beyond a certain number of standard deviations such as plus, plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations then it's it's in the two percent two and a half percent in each tail it's kind of in the statistically significant uh, region um, so 
to what what that would suggest to me is um, that we're we're effectively um, what we're doing is we're taking our correlation coefficient, we're adjusting it and standardizing it, and we're looking to see how far how far above or below a kind of hypothesized mean of zero our correlation coefficient sits with with kind of plus one or negative one being the being the kind of ex, the extreme values it could take. The second method for working out a prob probabilities or the significance of the correlation coefficient involves the use of a T statistic with n minus two degrees of freedom. OK, so I haven't put the formula for either of these on this particular slide um, because you, you don't really need to know it. Um, but what, what this second method is essentially involves, not too different to the first, if you remember a T distribution, it's kind of similar to a Z distribution, but a bit flatter and wider. And again, we're, we're then looking to see if our, our correlation is significantly different to a hypothesized, uh, a hypothesized mean of zero. So. Uh, it seems to me that when we use this particular, this, this second method, it's like we're doing a one sample t-test. We've got this hypothesized mean of zero and we're looking to see how many standard deviations, um, how many standard deviations our, our correlation sits away from that, that mean of zero and whether it's, whether it's in the extreme tails and statistically significantly different. OK, and that's going to be a function, as you know, when you when you kind of looking at critical values for a T distribution that involves looking at uh, the degrees of freedom and looking at values in tables or getting software to calculate it for you. All right. So that's correlation. These are the key points to remember. We can look at the correlation coefficient gives us the size of the correlation. It's effectively a measure of effect size. We can also, when we visualize it, we can see what the direction of the correlation is. And our coefficient, our correlation coefficient will tell us that as well. If it's negative or positive, scores are increasing. If it's positive, scores are increasing on both variables if it's simultaneously. If it's negative, our scores on one increase, scores on the other decrease. And we've got a p-value associated with it. So these are, whenever you report, formally report a... Uh, a correlation, uh, the output for a correlation, then these are the three things you've got to look for. Uh, how big the correlation is, the direction of the correlation, and whether or not it is statistically significant. Okay, so another point uh, of note that I haven't put on this slide is uh, the degrees of freedom for correlation are generally are n minus two. Okay, so when you're trying to work out uh, what the degrees of freedom are, it's minus two, I guess it's, <coughs> it's uh, minus one from each each of the two variables that you're correlating, okay? On a related subject, if we take our, our correlation coefficient um, and square it, we get something called R squared which is known as the coefficient of determination. Uh, and when we do this, we get a measure of the amount of variability in one variable that is shared by the other variable. Okay, so R squared is, so just to be confusing, I think, so the Pearson's correlation coefficient R is, is denoted by this lowercase r. When we square it to give us R squared, the coefficient of determination, uh, that's capitalized, so it's capital R squared for some reason. And R squared can be expressed as a percentage. So it's used as a measure of effect size in many statistical models that use straight lines to model patterns in data. And we'll just see more of this when we start looking at regression in the next, in the lecture and lab classes in two weeks time. It features, um, it features when in the output for regression analyses. Okay, so 
R squared tells us the amount of shared variance between the two, uh, the two variables. So squaring that correlation gives us the proportion of shared variance between the two. Uh, so what does that mean and what does it look like? So if we take our R value and we square it, it gives us a percentage amount of overlap between the two variables. Okay. And the area of shared variance on this particular figure. So uh, we've got variable one, which is um, the, the values of which are encompassed in this circle, variable two, and the amount of overlap between the two is the shared variance here, yeah, if we were to visualize it in this way. Uh, and if, for example, if, if R is 0 0.6, then if we square that, the shared variance is 0 0.36. So six squared, six times six is, is 36. Yeah, or 0 0.6 times 0 0.6 is 0 0.36. Uh, and we can express that as a percentage, as I said, 36%. So in other words, R squared in this case, if this, if this particular diagram was, was shown as an, an R of a correlation coefficient of 0 0.6, we can say that uh, 30 thir about 36% of the variance uh, in these two variables is shared variance, okay? Right, if we add a third variable that is correlated with both of the other two uh, to some degree, we can see how much variance all three models, all three variables share. Okay, so you can see that here. I've added a third variable in, and that overlaps with the first variable. That's a, that's the, the extent to which it correlates with the first variable. It overlaps with the second variable. That's the extent to which it overlaps with it. It is correlated with variable two, and you've also got this region where all three uh, overlap. So we've got shared variance for variables one, two, and three there, this little kind of weird uh, triangular shape in the middle of that diagram. And this is useful to know because it allows us to do something called partial correlation, where we remove the variance attributed to a third variable. So we might want to do this when we're looking to see what the relationship between two variables is whilst controlling for a third variable to which they are both related. Okay, so notice that the shared variance between variables one and two has been reduced in this situation because some of it has been accounted for um, by variable three that we've removed. So partial correlation removes the variance attributed to the third variable. So if we, the circle there that's in white is what was variable three. And if we cut out the var uh, how much how much variance is accounted for by that third vari variable, the amount that it shares with variable one, the amount it shares with variable two, and the amount that it shares with both variables one and two, then we have we we have a ratio uh, of shared variance to unique variance that's that's actually decreased. It's got smaller, but because we've controlled, we've kind of partialed out the influence of the third variable. Okay. So that leads us on to part and partial correlations. So the most common correlation we're going to uh, correlation when we're controlling for the effects of other variables is the partial correlation. Okay, this is uh, this is the example we were just looking at really on this slide. We've kind of we've partialed out um, the third variable to see how much. If we, you know, if we if we condition on that, if we control for that, how much are the other two uh, related? How much do they correlate? All right. Part correlation, also known as semi-partial, is used when we are when we want to control for the effects of a third variable on only one of the variables in the correlation. So, um, so. Um, in that, in the previous example, it might be the case that we want to just look at the effect. We, we want to just look at the control for the effects of uh, 
variable three on variable two, in that case, we'd use what's called a part or semi-partial correlation. And it's most useful when we're looking at the unique relationship between two variables when other variables are ruled out. OK, so we're controlling for the influence of other variables, essentially. Uh, it's also useful when we're trying to explain the variance in one particular variable, such as a DV, from a set of predictors. And we can conduct all these analyses, the bivariate correlation we've looked at first, and then these part and partial correlations where we're controlling for the influence. We're partialing out the influence of uh, a third or more variables. And we can conduct these in, in these types of analyses in SPSS, and that is what we shall do in the lab classes uh, this week. Right. Um, that's all I'm going to say about correlation. Now we're going to talk about categorical data. So we, we use correlation to look at relationships between association uh, relationships or associations between continuous or scale variables. Uh, what about if we want to look at relationships between categorical variables? Uh, well, when we have, if we have two categorical variables, say, and we want to look to see if they're, how they're related, how they're associated, uh, we can tabulate the relationship between categorical variables in a contingency uh, table, sometimes also referred to as a confusion matrix, such as the one shown on this slide. Uh, and we can populate, populate this table with the frequency counts of cases and observations falling into each cell where the two categories intersect. So I've made this up, this table, and it's it's supposedly got two categorical variables, whether someone's tall or short, and the second categorical variable, which is on the which is on it relates to the columns, is whether someone's left or right-handed. So uh, what we do is uh, have some arbitrary measure category cut off limit whether between tall and short and we'd count how many how many tall people are left-handed how many are right-handed and just put frequency counts in those how many short people are left-handed how many right people are right-handed we can total up the columns for left for right for tall for short and we can work out a grand total yeah um when we're looking at the relationship between categorical variables the null hypothesis that we are testing is that the proportions or numbers uh, are the same across the cells between the different categories. Yeah. So if there's no relationship, we should expect frequency, the frequency of counts to be evenly distributed or um, distributed across the cells of the table in relation to kind of our data set. Um, you know, we might have... Uh, they, we, they wouldn't be the case that if we have 100 participants, we'd get 50 in each of those four cells, uh, sorry, 25 in each of those four cells. Um, because we know, a priori, we know that only about 10% of the population are left-handed. So we'd expect the left-handed column to have less people in it. Uh, and that would be a function of our data. Um, so from... From a contingency table like this, we can calculate the numbers we would expect to find in each cell of the table if the null hypothesis were true. OK, so if the null hypothesis were true and it's just a matter of there is no relationship between those variables and it's just a matter of chance how many you get in each, um, then we we can we can use this formula on the slide called expected value of a cell to work out how how many how many counts we'd expect in each of the cells uh, given our data set and the way that's worked out is you can see from this little formula at the bottom expected value of a cell is equal to the row total times the column total divided by the grand total and that will tell us that will give an expected value for each cell uh, once we have worked out our expected counts, given our sample size, we can then compare these to the observed counts in our data set. OK, and we do that using chi-square. So the question of how close the observed counts, what we actually see in our data set, are to the expected counts that we worked out using the expected value formula there is 
is quantified by calculating a chi-square value using the formula shown on this slide. That's So that capital X uh, squared there is obviously the Greek word chi-squared, and that's equal to um, summing over sigma notation, the sum of observed minus expected squared divided by expected, where observed is the actual observed frequency, it's how many, how many uh, participants fell into the cells for our actual data, the expected is what they expect here under the null hypothesis, if they're not related, what we'd expect the number to be in that cell. Okay, so that is a measure of um, association for categorical, categorical variables. Um, and chi-square is a statistic that's based on comparing the frequencies you observe in a category to the frequencies you might expect to get in the categories by chance. Uh, and it's chi-squared is checked against a distribution known as the chi-square distribution. It's actually a family of distributions and it changes depending on the mean. Um, but I won't say too much about that because you, you don't really need to know it. All you, all you need is the de degrees of freedom and you can look up the critical value of chi-squared in the table. So you've got your chi-squared um, and for your observed values, and if it's bigger than the critical value, you would say that there is a significant relationship between the two variables. Okay, so SPSS does all of this for you and it tells you if your chi-square statistic is significant. So we don't have to do things the old fashioned way of getting our chi value, getting out the tables, looking at our degrees of freedom and looking up the critical values based on those degrees of freedom. Uh, software does it all for us. Uh, but you still have to be able to interpret what the result means, though. So, for, for data to be categorical, just a few, a few rules, really, uh, or a few important things to note or remember with chi-square when we're doing these categorical tests of association. For data to be truly categorical, there must be independent counts of individual cases or observation. So what, what I mean by that is a participant can only contribute to one cell of the table. OK, so a, a part, so if we've got an individual who is left handed, they can only contribute to either uh, the tall or the short. They can't contribute a, a data point to both. OK, so they've got to be independent. Uh, we also need a nin minimum number of counts uh, per cell, and that's usually five per cell. So uh, it, that and that relates to the expected frequencies of the cells. So they need to be greater than or equal to five. Otherwise, we might be getting erroneous results. It's kind of similar to. It's one of the assumptions for chi-square that's similar to the sorts of assumptions we have to meet when we're doing other parametric tests. Uh, we need expected frequencies of greater than or equal to five. At least, okay. If you've got a big enough data set, it's usually not a problem. Finally, on there, useful to remember the degrees of freedom for chi-square contingency tables are degrees of freedom is equal to number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Okay, so with a two by two contingency table, where we've got one cat, one of our categorical variables has got two levels, the other's got two levels that would be the degrees of freedom be, would be one. So that'd be two rows minus one, which is one times two columns minus one, which is one. So one times one is one. Hopefully that's clear. Quite a useful formula to remember when you're looking at, um, uh, when you're kind of looking at the output for chi-square or reporting, formally reporting the results. Okay, so as I've said previously, um, Reporting a test statistic and a p-value is all, but p-value is all very well and good. It's all useful, um, but we also are interested in the practical significance. So it's useful to have a measure of effect size. For correlation, wasn't too much of an issue with because correlation is it is of itself an effect size, a measure of effect. Um, but for chi-square, we've got a couple of options. So. The odds ratio is a common measure of effect for categorical data, and it works best for a two by two contingency table. Um, so the ratio of the odds of an event occurring in one group compared to another 
is given by this formula here. OBS ratio is equal to um, the count in cell B divided by the count in cell A divided by the count in cell D divided by the count in cell C. Now this would, uh, this formula can change. It would depend on what, what you were comparing essentially, um, which of these cells you would divide by which other, okay? Um, but that would, that would give us an odds ratio. And it'd say it what what it would essentially tell us if we had you know if we had um, more tall right-handed people uh, significantly more tall right-handed people than we did uh, left-handed people it'd tell us something like uh, the chances of being tall when you're right-handed are three times that of being tall when you're left-handed or four times five times whatever it is that type of thing it's uh, quite an intuitive thing. Um, if you have a variable with more than two categories, then Kramer's V is a useful measure of the strength of association. So if you imagine like a, the odds ratio there is quite, yeah, that's the formula for it. And if you've only got four cells, a two by two contingency table, that's quite neat. But imagine you add three by two or four by four or something like that, then working out the odds ratio would get a bit more tricky. Uh, so Kramer's V is a bit, is, is a useful measure when you have more than, uh, when at least one of your categories has more than two levels, okay? Um, and it can be interpreted like a correlation coefficient with rough guidelines for what's a small, medium and large effect size. So point, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0.5 that type of thing i know these canned kind of guidelines for effect size are not ideal but we do we do make use of them they're, they're quick and dirty rules of thumb um okay so before i finish quick example so this is some chi square output from it's it's basically two categorical variables age group and that's been split that's actually been made into to a categorical variable uh, individuals great older than 25 individuals younger than 25 and violent crime so whether those individuals have engaged in violent crime or not so yes engaged in violent crime no they haven't okay so um, you can see the um, contingency table um, on the top left and you can see um, the SPSS output for that contingency table at the bottom there. So that's copied and pasted. That's that same contingency table copied and pasted from SPSS. And it's giving you the percentage of um, percentage uh, within violent crime. Um, it, it's showing you the percentage proportions for each column as a um, for violent crime, whether they engaged in it or not. And you are uh, on this on this particular table, um, if you look at it, you can see that under 25s, 79.8% uh, engaged in violent crime, 56.5% didn't. If you look at over 25s, 43.5% didn't, 20.2% did. Uh, the thing that's interesting there is these, these are the percentages. To add up to 100, these are the column percentages. So what we would expect to see here is that there's probably going to be a significant difference between though the under 25s who did and those that didn't uh, engage in violent crime and the difference between the over tw under 25s that did and the over 25s that did. Um, so the chi-square, that table is limited in the information it provides you. And when we run these sorts of analyses in the lab classes, I'll show you how to get some more useful information that tells you where the statistically significant differences arise. So this is what I said when uh, I mentioned that you still have to interpret what this means. So we can see here we've got, formally reported, we've got a, chi-square value so we've got chi-squared we've got our degrees of freedom in brackets one is equal to 11.09 p is equal to 0.001 so we've got for this particular example uh, 
that's telling us we have a, a statistically significant association between these two variables. And we can eyeball the table below and look at those column percentages and try to figure out where they are. But it can be tricky and it can be easy to be wrong about it. But there are ways where we can obtain standard residuals that tell us whether um, whether the counts in a cell uh, differ significantly um, from what we'd expect them to be by chance. All right, that's all stuff we'll cover in the lab class. And that's all I'm going to cover today. So I've only put one reference on this this week. That's the Andy Field textbook. It's got a couple of reasonably good chapters, I think, on correlation and um, categorical data. So chapters 8 and 19 on the most recent version. Um, chapter 19, the categorical data, it covers chi-square, but it also covers log linear analysis. You don't need to read all of it, so just focus on chi-square stuff, because that's all we're focusing on at the moment. All right, so hopefully that was useful. Um, I'm recording this in the afternoon, and I probably needed a bit more coffee before I did it, but... It's certainly within, it's good at this time, this week, I've not gone over time. I've managed to fit everything in within the hour, which is good. And um, I shall see you guys in the class and lab classes soon.